Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today, we're going to be channeling, having a conversation with Phil Hartman in the afterlife. So this is an unusual session for me as I'm entering into it because I don't usually channel people or aren't drawn to people who had suspicious or difficult deaths. So Phil Hartman was murdered by his wife. And I try to stay away from like drama and, and the kind of the, the energies around that um, because death isn't the definition of someone's life. It's not the reflection of the wholeness of the bodies of work that they've left to hear for us, that the legacy that they have, that the talents that they shared, and sometimes they just become famous for their death. And I, I don't, I have a really hard time with that myself. That's a personal thing for me. So why Phil Hartman then? You're probably saying, well, Bridget, why are you going to talk with Phil Hartman? Because I feel his energy. And Part of that is probably my own doing because I've been watching a vlog channel and um, you guys may have heard me mention it before, uh, Days with Jordan the Lion. <laughs> I love Days with Jordan the Lion. I haven't watched it for quite a while and I thought during this time when it seems like the economy is a bit slower and things, I wanted to be able to go back and support other YouTubers that I really know that that's their source of income, that's their livelihood, is just YouTube being a YouTuber. And so Days with Jordan the Lion is one of those ones that initially with Above Life Channel got me interested in Hollywood again. And I've always been interested in Hollywood, but you know, actually seeing someone walk around Hollywood on Hollywood Boulevard and see the stars on the, the Walk of Fame and seeing the Chinese theater, seeing the sites, the iconic sites that I have seen physically myself in this lifetime, because I've had several trips to California in my childhood and my teen years and that, and always felt an affinity to it. And so I thought I wanted to go back and watch some of his videos and just literally leave it on like as much as I can in the background, just so that he can get more minutes, more viewers, more likes, that kind of a thing, you know? Cause that's how you support YouTubers. You know, that's how you do it. Especially people who do a, like a lot of ads and stuff in their, in their channels or in their videos and that kind of thing. That's how you support them, right? So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do that again. And one of the videos that came up on the screen was the Phil Hartman house. And I thought, uh, do I really want to watch this one, you know, or listen to it in the background, have it going in the background while I'm, you know, doing the dishes or making dinner? And I thought, yeah, yeah. Because when Jordan portrays it or shares the story, he's very open, very sincere, and he's not about like all that drama about it necessarily. But there is a curiosity that comes through, I think, and that many of you as viewers probably are drawn to in video. So let's get to the channeling. I know some of you are like, Bridget, get to the channeling. Well, guess what? It's my channel and I'm talking to Phil Hartman, so you can wait for me to get to it. And so I suppose I don't really know why I'm channeling Phil Hartman. <laughs> I have no idea. So let's bring him in and find out, shall we? This video is being recorded in May, on May 5th, 2020. Not sure if that has anything to do. I feel like there's a child. I feel like a daughter, a young girl. I feel like almost like hippie like long hair, pretty. He must have been married before because um, I see two like spouses. Um, like I feel like I'm looking through a picture book, like a photo album. And somebody's birthday is in, I think, in May or June. There's a birthday coming up, um, up and coming, coming up. And so Phil, I know you from, I wanna say Saturday Night Live, but I don't think that's right. He's definitely, he's a good writer, you guys. Like it feels like he's a really good skit writer, like a really good writer. And so he may have very well written for Saturday Night Live. Um, but the, the connection is the news radio show, which I watched. Did you guys watch that? news radio show 
I watched that. So that's how I remember you, Phil, is from that. Um, I feel like you, it was probably the 90s then. Um, there's this energy of this dry humor and I appreciate that being a Midwestern person. Um, and then he shows me an I state. So Indiana or Illinois showing me an I. Uh, I don't know if like on a show that he did besides the news radio, you guys, I don't know. Um, what's the Illinois or the Indiana? I think it's Illinois. I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. I think it's Illinois. Um, it's almost like a sports team thing or something. Illinois, something, something. Indiana or Illinois. I, I, I. Okay, I can't hear. I'm not hearing clear audiently. I'm seeing the information and I'm not seeing a whole picture. I'm seeing like pieces, like kind of sentimental things he's showing me, kind of sentimental things. And I see a martini glass too, like alcohol, like a martini glass. Um, do you want to share what the best part of your experience as a person was? Like, what are what are you most proud of, or what do you most um, like to be remembered for? He says, "Yeah, writing." He said, "You got it. You got it. Writing, the ability to write, write, creative, to be creative and write, to write." He said, "That's the when things really come together and there's this cohesion." He says, "You can give a really good um, group of actors a." kind of a foundation or a base, and then they can take it to levels that you didn't even expect they could go to. You know, you have to kind of lay the groundwork though. You have to have kind of a solid concept first, and then, then it's just, you know. Would you consider yourself more of a comedian or an actor, or what would you consider yourself a comedian? A comedic actor, he says. A comedian is, is um, probably more how I would be described. Um, a humorous actor, maybe. Um, but writing, writing feels like a really important thing. So I just loved it. He said, I just loved it. There's a lot of joy, you guys, in acting and being in a group of people and seeing what comes from the idea. He says, like an idea. And he kind of, you know what he shows me, you guys, is the um, Whose Line Is It Anyway? I think that's the name of the show. There's a show with like, um, oh, I can't think of the guy's name. I can see his face. He's, uh, I can't even think of his name right now, but where there's a couple of actors from a show, Drew Carey from his show, and then they like, you know, do kind of impromptu extemporaneous speaking stuff and um, uh, that kind of, it's like a show. I'm Wayne, somebody Wayne is also in that show, was in that show. Um, some really interesting actors and stuff like that. Like he's showing me that, like that's the kind of, like I would want to be in that. He's like, I want to be part of that. I would want to be part of that. Did you have any famous um, actors or mentors or anybody that you looked up to or favorites? He says, I wasn't always in acting. You know, I wasn't always in acting. Um, that was, I think that was stated on the blog, actually. I think Jordan, on Days with Jordan the Line, I think he said, I'm trying to remember, I think he said that you did like graphic arts or artist, like art design or something like that before. So it wasn't like acting was a thing that you learned and did or whatever. Um, but did you have any, like, who were your favorite actors? And he's like looking at me like Laurel and Hardy, like he literally shows me Laurel and Hardy, you know, on the Three Stooges and stuff like that, like that kind of slapstick, kind of funny, real impromptu to um, um, acting, he says. He says acting. Um, then he shows me Robin Williams. Interesting. What is the deal with Robin Williams? I met Robin. I've met Robin Williams, he says. Um, he came here after I did. As you know, he says, as you know, he came, transitioned after I did. But he, real deep, he's a real deep guy. Real, a lot of talent there. He says, a lot of talent there, a lot of talent. Um, he says, we didn't run in the same circles, but I, I did, I did meet him a few times and um, have been able to, you know, had interacted or had conversations with him. It's kind of what it seems like, almost like he ran into him in a club or a comedy club or a kind of social thing or something. Um, and then he says, Joe, somebody, Rogan, Joe Rogan, I don't know. I had that name sounds really familiar to me. Does he have a show? He might have a show or something. Joe Rogan, like comedian kind of type. Um, 
and I don't know why he shows me him. Not sure why, you guys. Um, but he mentions him. And I think he's kind of like, um, kind of crass with the words he uses and things like that. I think he, he swears a lot. I think um, that's kind of the vibe I get. And comedian, he was comedian too, or he is comedian too. Um, I know that. I can't think of where he's from. Oh, I think he's from Fear Factor. Isn't he? In, wasn't he like the Fear Factor host? And I'm sure he's had a lot of career before that, but that's how I know, remember him. Um, okay, Phil, so let's talk about, let's talk about the tough stuff. Can we talk about the tough stuff? Yeah, he said, yeah. He said, you know, the whole mystery, there's really no mystery here. He says, there's not really, there's not really that kind of romanticized mystery around my death. He said, you know, I wish if I could have written a different ending, it probably would have been something more, um, well, he said, okay, so can you say that again? I can kind of hear you, but I can't totally hear you. It's almost like smoking, like he shows me smoking. He said, like he thought that if he, for his death, he thought that it would have been more likely, he would have expected himself to die from like a heart attack or like lung cancer or something like that, like that kind of thing. It's like, I would have expected my health to be an issue for me, a problem for me, not my wife. Okay, not my wife. Now, it's true though that she did, your wife did have some mental health stuff because that was mentioned also in the vlog yes he said yeah yeah she's crazy she was really really volatile he says really volatile were you ever afraid for your life were you ever afraid of that uh, you know at times it's more um you never really think it's going to be that bad like you never really want to believe that someone that you loved was um you know capable of something like that you you don't really want to um believe I think how bad it is so would you say something to people that are in situations like that dealing with mental health yeah, yeah get help get help and don't stick around don't stick around you can't put on yourself the blame or or the the job of making that person feel better or be better be healthier because they make their own they you know people make their own choices they make their own choices. I would have expected, I wouldn't have been surprised if she would have, uh, at, when on her mood swing, she has a bipolar, some kind of bipolar disorder, you guys, is what it looks like, um, or she had. He says, I would have expected her to to kill herself. I wouldn't, that would not have shocked me at all um, because at times she was so miserable, so, so angry at the world. And I, I kind of blame myself in, a bit, you know, I mean, for for the relationship part, there's a part of blame if you're going to assign blame or assess blame. It's, there's a part that, I mean, I could have done things differently too. And that doesn't mean there would have been a different outcome though. So I don't, I think it's really important to say to people who are in a situation dealing with mental health of someone that they love or care about that, yeah, you can do the best that you can, but that's it. You can't, you can't make um, someone make different choices. That, that's really something that you do not have control over. And uh, are, so are you angry or do you, how do you feel towards your wife now in the afterlife? Oh no, he says, oh no, I'm not angry. I forgive her. He's like, no, I'm not angry. Mm, I'm not angry. Mm, I'm not angry. I'm not, um, I wasn't totally surprised, he says. Okay, so my understanding from the vlog that I listened to was that you were sleeping and she went out and then she came home and went to your room and killed you. And so while you were sleeping or were you awake or can you talk about that at all? Or I mean, is that poignant? Is that important? I wasn't surprised, he says, I wasn't shocked. I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid because we we'd had really difficult um, confrontations like that before. He says like that before, but it was never. I didn't really expect her to actually. Oh, this is tough. I don't want to see this. There's a lot of blood, you guys. Oh God, I I don't like being clairvoyant. Isn't fun. Um, he says, you don't have to. He's like, don't look, don't look. 
He says, I couldn't believe it. I was, in, I was shocked. And I don't think that there was a gun. That's the thing. I'm not quite sure how... If there was, she shot him a lot because there was a lot of blood. I don't think, I don't even hear that. I don't hear it. I don't hear a gun. That's interesting. I don't usually do the murder stuff, so it's all new to me. Phil, can you share with me what the purpose is for our connection, for our contact today? He says to open up, to recognize the importance of mental health. There is a crisis, he says, in America today. There is a crisis globally, but in America, it's it's awful. It's it's something that is a long time, long time disease, and mental health is something that is is treated so few and far between and so sporadically that it doesn't. There's not a consistency about it. There's not a recognition about what the real issues are. Dealing with your mental health and, and, and preventing yourself or the ones you love from going off the deep end is something that is, is part of so many relationships. And now, where you're at now, right now, right here, right now, the stressors of things like finances and health and the economy and the future are all things that add an extra layer of pressure into that. He's like, it's like a pressure cooker. It's just, I mean, what do you expect? Of course, the people are going to explode. Of course, people who are already volatile or on the edge are going to take the leap and go over the edge and hurt other people or kill themselves in the process. And then there's loved ones that are grieving, children that are grieving the loss of their parents. And the loss of their childhood. There's not, there's a lot of nurturing that needs to happen here. There's a lot of, of awareness that needs to be brought to the forefront. And, and it's really important, I think, to share that I am not angry. I'm not, I for completely forgive. The act is not a reflection of either one of us, of, of Bren or of myself. It's tragic and unfortunate and it's but it's not unforeseen this is a this isn't something that it is is just for a tabloid this is real life for people now that are struggling and that's the importance that's the priority bridget that's why we're talking today phil you have such a now i now i know and now i'm glad that we had this conversation because when i started pushing the record here i thought i have no idea what's going to come through in this channeling session or why I'm even channeling you. Maybe it's just I've been watching a vlog and so it's in my mind. It might just be my brain doing it. But I thought, let's connect and see how this goes. Let's really show up in full authenticity and see what happens and be open. And instead of me just kind of saying, no, I'm not going to do that because of this, you know. He says, yeah, you got to change your mind. Everyone has to recognize that the, you all have the freedom to change your mind and to not be afraid to ask for the help that you need and to consistently ask even if you're you feel belittled or even if it's not a time to make light of the the care that you need for your mind for your mental health for your mood that's such a key part of your your health and your your ability to to be not just a productive member of society but to really give something back and everybody relies on you in that way and we rely on each other in that way and it's it's so so it makes me so sad to know that there's a lot of suffering going on and and in private and isolated and separate and not it's not accepted as something that is a, a natural human need. Instead, it's still judged. There's still bias. There's still prejudice for people that say, well, I'm bipolar or I have anxiety disorder or I have attachment disorder or I have this or that or I feel, I simply just feel sad, really depressed. I don't understand. I feel disconnected. And all of those things should be completely part of our healthcare system and of taking care of one another, each other, and, and most importantly, yourself. You've got to be able to recognize that for yourself. 
and the codependency that we're in and these relationships that we're in there it's very lopsided and it does confuse things and it, is, it can be really hard to know when to pull back and when to save yourself and clearly i didn't make that decision i didn't make it and i want other people who are watching this to be able to have the freedom and let go of the guilt and save their own lives and to be able to be in the space to be able to do that for yourself without feeling like you are responsible for the happiness or the wellness the mental wellness of someone else you can't you can't take that burden on that's that's completely unrealistic you're not god are you you are not the ultimate determiner of the fate of another you are not you are not that don't don't um put that on yourself that's completely irrational unrealistic not not even fair not fair at all not fair so that's what i wanted to say so thank you for letting me share that thank you for letting me talk about that wow you guys i'm really gonna get emotional all of a sudden <laughs> it's may 5th 2020 and this is phil hartman with a very powerful message for us Kind of a long way around the fence, huh? I've been beating around the bush here, trying to get to this point, but this is a powerful message. So again, I'm gonna to mention to you to reach out and get the resources that you need for your own mental health, as well as for your loved ones. Many times on the back of your insurance card, there's like a number that you can call for crisis. There's also crisis hotlines, um, organizations like SAVE, can help to support your mental health and to support you while you are supporting the mental health of someone else and also your local government agencies, usually your counties have crisis hotlines in the human services area, all right? So please make sure you reach out, you ask friends, ask, um, You have to ask for the assistance that you need and you can't be afraid of the stereotypes or you can't be afraid to do it for yourself and for your loved ones. So look online, there's no excuses. You can do online stuff, you can do text stuff, you can be totally anonymous, you can do counseling in person, you can do stuff over the phone. There are so many hotlines and so many resources for you. So if you don't reach out, that's your choice. And that is on you. That is on you, okay? So this is Bridget with Above Life Channel. I want you to be healthy. I want you to feel connected. I want you as a spirit and as a human being to feel inspired and have hope. And I know that that can be a very challenging process at times. Remember, this is your life. It's yours. So live it, please. Just live it. Thank you so much for watching.